do is package and ship. Talk about a burden and a need that is so pressing, I guess is the best word for it. And it just the, the message that I have is just kind of, I mean, I'm so broken inside, I'm not sure I can even describe to you what God is wanting me to tell you this morning. If, uh, in the book of Hebrews, in the, it's the second chapter, and verse 3 says, How can we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? What is it that is so important that how are we going to look away from everything that is going on around us? And we look and we see everything that is taking place worldwide. We can't even see what's happening. Just thinking about the ones that we was talking about this morning that was going back into the drug lifestyle. Talked to a young man this week, and I'm going to preach in a minute, I'm going to try to anyway. Talked to a young man this week, I say young man, he's 42 years old, me, that's a young man. And uh, he was talking, he said, he, uh, he's lost, by the way. Who was talking, he said back when he was somewhere, one of his friends came up to him and came up to him and said, by the way, I just, I'm on, I, I keep this quiet, but I won't, I, you're close, I won't let you know. He came out of the closet and said, I'm homosexual. He said, that's all well and good, but I want you to know I'm not. And uh, he said over the period of the next few months, as they talked, and the young man that was admitted his lifestyle to him says, I don't know what to do. God is not going to accept me like I am. I don't know what, how can I get her? How, what? He said, this boy was, a, his daddy is a Methodist minister. Like I said, he's, he's out, he's lost. And God's put him on our pathway for a period of time. I'm going to work with him and try to gently ease him back into the church. But he was hurt so badly when I can gather from the ministry and things that took place and all that's going on. Uh, he, he said he kept talking to him over and over and over again. What am I going to do when I die? Because I can't go to heaven because of the lifestyle I've chosen. Searching for an outstretched arm. Searching for a way out. These people that are sitting back that we were talking about that's taking, whether they're taking pills, whether they're putting a needle in their arm, whether they're snorting it up their nose or whatever other ways you can do it, I don't know. Smoking it, whatever the case may be. They are doing all these things and they don't really want to. In the last few weeks, we've had three different people come to us with domestic violence in their families. We were talking this morning, but everybody is staying in the same position, in the same boat, and are just hanging on. And we don't understand why they is, we can't comprehend, but the thing of it is, there's still a cry going out, I need help. I don't understand what's going on. I don't see what is taking place in my life. I'm in a bondage that I can't get out of. I'm in a place that I don't understand what is going on. Why is it that we can't seem to break the bondage that is in this place. I'm 
trying to decide what's supposed to preach this message. I got I got my notebook or not this morning, so just bear with me for a few seconds. God is wanting his people to understand that he is God, that he is the only hope, that he is the only strength. There was a time in Israel when all they could do was on a regular basis bring in a blood sacrifice to the priest. And the priest would take it and he would give it the visual inspection first. He'd pull the bull back. He would look at it, search the skin, search every hair that was, every piece of wool, hair, whatever you want to call it, that was in it, trying to make sure there was no blemish in it whatsoever. He would inquire of the time of its birth. It had to be under a one year of age. When he had done the visual inspection, because it was to be a sacrifice for sin. He would take that little lamb, slit its throat. All because sin required a payment. The blood would pour out of this lamb. Now forgive me for having it this way, but I want, I got it somewhere I've got to go right now. The blood had to be shed signifying a death that sin had to die, that what the sacrifice was there was to kill the sin. They would then take this animal and they would skin it, signifying it was now naked before God completely. And now they could see what was under the skin to make sure there was no blemish under the skin. So another search was taking place upon this sacrifice to make sure that there was nothing there to prohibit it from being an acceptable sacrifice unto God. They would then open it up, the stomach, the intestines, and all was taken out. Signifying that the sin would plump into the root of the being where all the digestion took place and everything else. They would throw this on the fire and burn it. They would then take the lamb in this condition and lay it upon the altar and would burn it. This was the only escape they had for sin. This was the only ability they had to cover the sin. They had to go on a regular basis. Anybody in here sinless? Can you imagine having to do this? If you didn't afford, couldn't afford land, they'd bring two turtle doves. If you was in any situation, but it was all in an attempt to pay a debt that we could not pay. It was all an attempt to escape something that was predestined in our lives. It's one of man wants to die, but after this, the judgment. It was all in a place to escape God's judgment. So for years, these priests, and they take, they had the power, didn't they? They could pretty much tell you what you were going to get, what it was going to cost you, and how he was going on, it related that to the labor into the churches. But this morning, I'm going to attempt to go where we was going to go this morning because as I see what's taking place, if man is still <coughs> trying to escape judgment in his own happiness, we're still trying to escape the things that is holding us back. In the book of Matthew, Chapter 3, and I'll start reading the first verse in just a moment. Father, this morning we're just so proud that we serve the true and the living God. 
We're so thankful, God, that you made a way that we had never had made. That you opened up a way, God, that we couldn't see. The way of escape from your hand, from your wrath, from your judgment. There's only one way. So this morning, I just ask you, Father, to anoint this message. There is a burden in this place this morning, Father. And I pray that this burden will be filled in your name. Amen. Amen. Chapter 3, starting in verse 1. In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of God is at hand. What a message. That message is not being preached today. It's not being taught anymore today. It is an antiquated system to tell people you've got to repent. God's going to accept you just like you are. You do what you want to do because God's going to have to accept you. Anyway, that's the that's whole other message. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locust and wild honey. And there went out to him Jerusalem and all, all Judea and all the region around Jordan. And they were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees come to his baptism, he said to them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Bring forth, therefore, fruits meet for repentance, and not say within ourselves, We have Abraham our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise out of these stones, able out of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Who has warned us to escape? To flee the wrath that was there to come. What is it that was so deciding or so disturbing to these Pharisees and Sadducees that they would come out to a place along Jordan River and stand up on the banks and see what was taking place as this man stood there baptizing people and hearing people say, I have sinned against God. They weren't having to bring the blood sacrifice to John. They were just speaking the word. It was at the beginning point. About those times, the time that Jesus ministry is fixing to start right now. It was in those days that the ministry of Jesus, the ministry of grace, was fixing to begin. But they're standing there and they're in that place and they're looking and they're seeing what's going on and they want to say, I don't understand what these people are doing here. They're supposed to be in the temple. They're supposed to be bringing me the lambs. They're supposed to be bringing me the turtle dove. They're supposed to bring me the scapegoat. They're supposed to bring the bullets in here for sacrifice. This can't save them. Only what I do can save them. How can we escape if we're so bound up in religion that we can't move? These fat Sadducees and Pharisees were so bound up in their religion, in their traditions, in their way of doing things that they could not and you begin to see what was going on in front of their eyes. And today we're in the same boat. There's nothing wrong with what I fix the table when it comes to this place and we're scared to move away from it. We come into church. We open, it's like we've done this morning. We open up. We sing a couple of songs. We receive the offering. We sing a couple more songs and we turn the preacher loose. Within that, there is nothing wrong. But when that becomes, for we, if we ever deviate from that, God forbid we stop in the middle of the service and pray for somebody. <laughs> God forbid that we actually stop and listen to His voice as He's speaking to us and telling us there's something going on that we need to be having. His, he's got somebody's got His attention, and He wants us to be a part of that attention. Amen. We're so bound up in religion that we. Everything, religion will kill you. It will destroy you. It will bind you up and toss you off to one side. How can we escape if we're bound up in religion? These Sadducees and Pharisees were so bound up because they had the only way. They had a monopoly on the situation. They were the ones that everybody had to come to. And 
they had to look at it and say, nah, that ain't, that's not acceptable. You're going to have to bring me something else besides that. But now they're down here looking at this man. And they see him coming in. I'm going to get to something else here in just a minute. Now let me go ahead and get there now. They come and see John. John is not wearing a, I got a two-piece suit on another three-piece. But they, see, they don't see, I've ever seen a man wearing a, a two-piece or a three-piece suit. His tie is not tied. He don't have, his hair is probably disheveled. He's standing in the middle of the, road, the, middle of the Jordan River, soaking wet. Not somebody, he's wearing a uh, camel's hair garment. Rough looking feller. Nothing that, you know, you'd want to go see and think about. But nothing compared to the people that they were, the Pharisees was in their dress clothes and in their high hats and in their, wearing their things across their chest, showing the urine and the thermon and the, everything that they wore, their priestly garments. Why are these people coming to see this man that's dressed in camel's hair? And look at that, he's wearing a gold, a leather girdle. Only poor people wear those. Leather's cheap. Mine is silk. How do we escape? How do they think we get out of this by looking and listening to this man as he begins to talk about repentance? Don't he know that by the religious standards we've set, the only repentance they can have is if people come and offer this sacrifice. Goes on to say his food was locust and wild honey. And that's exactly what it was. It did not mean it was something other than it was not a symbolism or something else. They would take locusts and they would dry them out in the sun and they'd mix them with honey and butter. This was a poor man's food. This was not a rich man's food. This was something that was so looked down upon. I mean, these Pharisees are sitting up there and they're looking at these things. This religious situation that we're in, which is what we're fighting against. Islam is a religion. It is not a relationship. It is something that will bind you up and it will kill you. It will destroy everything that has... You, there's no hope in that religion. There's no hope in any religion, only in relationships. Amen. We have no way of escaping. They're sitting up there. I can almost see them standing up on the, the ridge and arms crossed and yeah. looking down their nose and said, well, what are these people are thinking down here? So bound up in traditions. Going through the motions. Going through the things that they always do. we got to go back up here. And when we get back, don't forget you've got to go up here and trim the lamps. Got to make sure the oil and the lamp, make sure it's burning. And, and you, you've got to sweep the floors when we get back. It has to be exactly perfect. And I don't know about, you need to go and, and, or, and iron your gown. It's got a bunch of wrinkles in it. And they're looking on the outside as to how they look and how they react. And the whole time they're looking at the avenue that God is now presenting before them. How can we escape? How can we get out of God's wrath if we don't look and see so great a salvation? They looked. Can I tell you what it boils down to? We kind of talked about a little bit this morning. In the mid-1920s, there was a man, his name is still today, almost a hundred years later, synonymous with what he did. On October 31st, 1926, he passed away. He was hanging upside down, dropped into a thing of water in a straitjacket, chained up, doing the same trick he'd done countless times before. At this particular point in time, he had a fever of 104, 104 his appendix had burst just a few days before that. He would, the show was going on. But if you talk about escape artists, you talk about somebody that could get out of anything, it was Houdini. 
that they would take him to the, he would walk into the police station and they'd, and they'd handcuff him and sit back and watch as he took the handcuffs off. They'd lock him up and they'd, bear, they'd get in there and strip search him. I mean, he didn't have a stitch of clothes on. And lock him up and put him into prison. And he would still get out. That's what a lot of Christians today are doing. We're going over and saying, Devil, lock me up. Jesus, let me out. Devil, lock me up. Jesus, let me out. We're coming that cycle. Lock it up. Let me go. Lock me up. Let me go. We don't understand that God has set something apart for us so great of an escape, so great of a place that we can look. We're just see, repeating the same thing. Lock up and escape over and over. Repeat, 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 because we cannot find the freedom that God is trying to put into His church, into His believers, into those that will walk pathway before Him. So how can we escape religion? How can we escape tradition? What is this holding us back? Point two, how do we escape our thoughts? The warfare in the mind. The things that we're constantly going and circling and making places in this mind. No doubt these men was up there thinking we've been doing it the same way for centuries. And this little fellow here ain't going to stop the thing. But there was one coming after him who did. Our thoughts. And I've heard this. I know God saved you, but I deserve what punishment I'm getting. I deserve the, the, what, the life I'm living. I deserve it because of what I did to him. Our thought process, we come into the natural. We're sitting back thinking how much we deserve what punishment God is putting upon us and how that we don't deserve any of his blessings. We don't deserve it, this gift of salvation. We don't deserve anything that is he is pouring out into his church because, well, just look at us. We're unholy. We can't even go a day without committing some kind of sin. I could have said an hour, but I've said a day. <coughs> how, how can we get past the thoughts of our mind as we sit back and we're looking and we're saying, God, I know what I have done and I know where I have been and I know what, who I am and I know all these things. I know, God, but I deserve the punishment. I'm, I'm sitting over here in the corner Realize I wish I could have some blessings, but I just don't feel like I don't, I don't deserve them, God, so don't give them to me. I don't want them. I'm not worthy. And you know what God's doing the whole time? He said, I'm saying, what are you talking about? You gave your life to me. You let me cover it in the blood. How dare you go back and bring something I don't know about and tell me I can't bless you because I don't know what you're talking about. And God said the whole time, said, you're just sitting there trying to make yourself in the position where you can't move because you're thinking about all these things and God said, huh? How can we escape the wrath of God when all we're thinking about is we deserve the punishment that we're getting? These people we was talking about earlier that are in Iraq right now that are sitting in the position they're in, you think they think they deserve the punishment that they're going through? In essence, they do. In essence, we do. But a price was paid. A price was paid so they could escape the greatness of God's wrath. When we start to thinking about all these things, we start thinking about the limitations that we put upon ourselves. I know we ain't shouting this morning, but it's, it was it's going to be that kind of a meeting this morning. Whenever we got here, we start looking at what was going on around us. But God's got something going on He wants to tell us about. He wants us to realize there is an escape. We start limiting God by the things that we're doing because we... sit back and because of our thought process because
because of what we are bound up in, we're thinking, God, how in the world can you use this? This nasty shell that I'm within, how can you use this mess? How is it that at times I just I don't know, how, how can you use this, God? What is it about this that you want to use? What is it, God, that you're looking at when you see me? Can you look? I know you can't see yourself in the mirror, but let's just look in the mirror for just a second. What do you see? What is it that you see when you look in that mirror? You see somebody that is messed up royally. You see somebody that is totally unworthy, unholy, unrighteous. I get a few other uns going in there. There's nothing pretty about you. You just despise the way that you look when you look in that mirror because it's something that you can't comprehend and the whole time what you're looking at is a sinner saved by grace. And if you can't see the grace that's been poured out, if you can't see the blood that's being poured out, if you can't see the greatness that God is trying to put into us, open your eyes this morning and let God show you through His eyes what He sees. Elijah was up on the mountain one time. Elijah. Him and his servant was up there and they come to get him. And he looked around him and all he seen was the, all the king's armies and all the king's men, and all the horses, and all of the enemy that was coming against these two men. And he ran inside and said, what are we going to do? We can't escape. They got us surrounded. Don't worry about it. God's got it. You, come here, you got to look outside and see what I see. They must, I don't know how many they are out there, but they horses all over the place. People have got their swords drawn, they've got their bows in full, and they're waiting for the kid, for the man to say, come get them after your horses. Come out here, we're going to take you in. So I don't have to see that. God's got this. But Elijah, I don't. Hold up. Father, open his eyes that he can see what I see. Father, this morning, open the eyes of everybody in this place, everybody that's hearing this, open their eyes to see what you see when you see them. When you see the power of the enemy come against them, let them see what you're doing. God, open up our eyes to understanding, to realize that you have made a way that is so powerful and so wonderful that we can even stand as these people are standing now as their children are being sacrificed to your name. God, open up our eyes to see what is around us and see what's going on. And all of a sudden, the man looked out and he said, I ain't worried no more. They outnumbered. God's got this. Open up our eyes to understanding that God's got this. There is nothing I can do. If I could do it, it'd be religion. If I could do it, it'd be traditional. If I could do it, it would be in my limited form, my limited place, what I can and can't do with my body. If I could do it, it would be all right with it. So what are we looking at? What is, our, what is our limitations? What are we seeing? We look in the mirror. What is our expectations? When we see that. Try and bring us back to a closing point here. So I want you to understand that God has some expectations for you that you don't understand. What are the expectations that is going on? What is that is the one thing that is looking at it? We see what's going on, and we begin to realize that as God as we see through God's eyes, what are we seeing? What is our expectations that God's going to do through us? He's going to make it where I can make the church every Sunday. 
He's going to make it to where I can survive for the rest of the week on what I get Sunday morning. He's going to make it to the place to where I can just... What's your expectations? Do we want to just float along and just... Don't cause no waves, no ripple effects. What is our expectations? When we call upon the name of Jesus, what do we expect to happen? When you lay on lay your hands on the sick in the name of Jesus, what do you expect to happen? When we lay the hands on those that are bound up by the drugs in Jesus' name, what do we expect to happen? When we see those that was talking about being possessed of devils, that happened absolutely right here in this town. I'm sure of it. There's oh, some yeah. around here that's possessed oh, of devils. Yeah. So what is your expectation? When the person comes up to you and says, listen, I know my lifestyle's going to damn me to hell, but what can I do? This is what I am. This is what I do. I can't put down the drugs. I can't put down the things that's holding me back. What is your expectation when God comes to you and says, you just what I want you to tell them. They don't have to live that way no more. I've made a way of escape for them. The Bible says, and wait a minute now, let's, let's, let's get real just a second. What is your expectations? I know what God's is. You know what God's is? The believers. Any, any believers in the house this morning? Amen. Any believers in the house this morning? You know what his expectation of you is? Lay your hands on the sick and they shall recover. Laying hand, casting out devils. Speaking with other tongues. Breaking bondages that people can't break themselves. Preaching the gospel in the entire world. Telling everybody how great he is. Whether your world is just right there in your neighborhood or your world is worldwide. Let everybody know. The thing is, he said, all believers have this expectation in my mind, in my spirit. I expect you to go out and lay hands on the sick. And I expect you to expect that I'm going to do something. But if your mind is still stuck back on some of the other things that, of what we used to be and how we used to act and what we used to think, nothing's going to take place. Amen. Because your expectation is not what God is going to do, but what He's going to do through you. Whew. Forgive me, Lord. Back in the early days when a fire was, a barn was on fire, something was part of the bucket brigade. You know what I'm talking about? They'd line up in both directions. I had buckets they had Full buckets went this way and empty buckets came back this way and they were refilled. They were trying to put the fire out. We got too many Christians, they trying to put the fire out. Somebody used to take that bucket of water and up and out, put a little gasoline, throw it on the fire and watch it burn. Go beyond what you're expected to do. Your time is sitting back where you're sitting back watching the barn burn. It's a place of storage. It's a place where people are coming in and seeing what's taking, where everything is at. But it's a time where we're sitting back and it's not on fire anymore because we're putting the fire out. It's about the time it gets started. We get the bucket brigade up. We start saying, we don't want that here. We don't want that here. It's, a, it's an avenue that we're trying to just survive. We just want to escape this world. We just want to escape. We're just worried about ourselves. God give me some paper drill to pour out the water put some gasoline in it. So when the fire begins to burn him bright, I'm going to tell you what, if the world can see what they saw here last Sunday morning, <laughs> you don't run like that in churches. Show some discretion. Show some decorum. Show some pride in where you're at. So you don't do the things that you don't shout hallelujah in the church. 
You're there for one purpose. That chair might move. You ain't in it. I'll shut up. <laughs> God is trying to make a way of escape. He has made the way. There is no doubt about it. But we're, we're sitting here trying to water down the way of escape. Amen. That barn is burned down for regions of new barn. Amen. Yep. That barn is stored up the best stuff that we can't, we don't need it no more. And God said, if you let it burn down, I'll build you a new one. I'll restock it with new equipment. I'll restock it in something that can be used greater than what it was used before. We'll raise up a barn together that can lift up my name. That we can lift up that place that people can come and see what I have done. So why are we trying to put the fire out and save everything that we have got going? What is it about that barn that we're looking at that we say, but I want to keep it? God says, I want you to not have to go through what you're going through, but you won't escape it. You won't go away from it. You won't give up and let me have it. So keep throwing the water on the fire. And you put it down a few minutes later, maybe a day or two later, the embers that are still down there, they get totally soaked, begin to rekindle a little bit. And it begins to move. and Something begins to take place. Something begins to bubble up just a little bit. And the smoke begins to rise up out of the ashes. And somebody's walking by and they said, get the bucket of water. It's fixing to catch up again. In the last days, I'm going to my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons, your daughters are going to see dream dreams and have visions. There's going to be an anointing so great in the last days that God said people are going to come in looking for an avenue of escape. Are you ready to show them what the escape route is? The Underground Railroad had a way of escape from north, from south to north. Be able to get people that was in bondage to a place where they could have freedom. It was a way of escape as they got in that thing as they went from here to there to the to they got finally got to the place where they were going. And God has said, I made a way of escape. All you've got to do is one trip to the altar, plead the blood that they applied to your life, and your way of escape is made true. I can expect something of you now. I've made a way before you. All I want you to do is trust me in everything that I say and everything that I do. If I tell you to move, then you'll talk to somebody, I want you to talk to them. If I tell you there's some need somewhere, I want you to act upon that need. If there's something that's going on that we don't understand, I expect you to ask me about it. Don't make any decisions without them complaining them to me first. God has made a great way of escape. We are still repeating the cycle. Lock me up. I'm going to escape. Lock me up. I've got to escape. The truth of the matter is, is each time we do that, the bondage of the locks gets stronger and stronger and stronger. Every time that Harry Houdini had to go back to a different place, they found a new way to do it. They graduated from handcuffs to stocks. They had chains around his ankles to his hands around his neck. Then he put him in a straight jacket. Then it was hanging him upside down. Put him in a milk can full of water. Let's see you escape out of this and still it. Buried one time alive. Covered up in sand. He barely made it out of that one. His hand came out just as he passed out and they pulled him on out. Each time the bondage gets harder and harder and harder to break. Each time that we they stumble and they fall, they go back into the drug scene, it's harder and harder to come back out because it's a, the addiction is getting stronger and stronger. Each time they go into a position of a falling away from God, there's something that that much more because they're thinking, well, God didn't keep me out to start with. Is it God's fault? No. It's not even their fault. It's our fault. God put us here as believers to show them the pathway, to show them a way of getting out, to show them 
uh, John said it the best. He who the Son has set free is free indeed. What does that mean? There's no more bondages once you've been set free. There's no more avenues of worry once you've been set free. Once you're in a place of a position where God has set you free, you set up housekeeping where you're at. You get to a place where you say, I can walk around with my head held up high now. I've been washed in the blood of Jesus. I am somebody now because I may still have my camel hair on. I may still have my leather girdle. I may be still eating poor man's food. But I am washed. I am regenerated. I am in pain. Christ can pay for my sin. I can escape the wrath of this world. My hell is not my home. Heaven is my home. It's a time when we get to realize that the Son is set free. It's free indeed. Bondage no longer has to control the lives of those we go into. Religion binds and stops a movement of God. But when God's people realize they're free and all they have to do is accept that blood and live a life professing unto Him and living a holy life before Him, that's a freedom. It's not a bondage. It's a freedom to walk up to somebody and say, I know you're in need. And look at that. Yeah, okay. God wants to deliver you from what you're in. God wants to set you free from the bondage of the place that you're at. And they start crying and I want I've tried several times, but I just never could get free. It's because not only are we not bringing forth, casting out the devil and breaking his bondage over the people, but we're not able, we don't understand the freedom that God has given to his people because our expectations is. Once they come to the altar and they pray the prayer behind the pastor or behind you, they're saved. They should be able to walk just like we walk. They should be able to stand on their own two feet and walk under the power and anointing of God. They don't need my help no more. How can we not help? How can we not pray? How can we not have that burden for these souls that are going through what they're going through and still call ourselves a child of God? Escape. God has set us free. And we are free in spirit. We are free in mind. We are free in body. We are free in love. You know what he just told me? So they could sit there and, and, and see that grandbaby or that baby being sacrificed as they stand up because they know that at the moment that takes place, there would be. They know that the very second that head is taken off, that baby was put on a stick or what it's put on, they know that baby's with me. And they know they're going to see them again because they're holding on to that promise. If you've been set free from the bondage that the sin of this world is trying to take you place, you have that freedom to realize that God has it all in His hands. There is a freedom in worshiping God. We've gone over the edge. And it's time to escape what the enemy is trying to stop God's people from. It's time for us to escape worrying about what things are taking place. It's time for us to escape our own mindsets and our own thoughts and our own beliefs and our own things that we're looking at. It's time for us to escape and let God have it all. Would you stand with me this morning? Father, as I look around this place this morning, I ask you, Father, to search every heart. And Father, whatever is holding us back from speaking your word as you give it to us, whatever is holding us back from being free indeed, take it from us right now, Lord. Help us to be live to the expectations you want us to live to. If we ask anything in your name, you have promised to make it come to pass. If my word abide in you and 
You abide in me. Ask what you will, it shall be done. So you know, all world preacher cost me a believe preacher that believe the baptized shall be saved. They'll lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. Cast out devils. You take up safe, safe turbots, it won't harm him. Drink anything between deadly poison, it won't harm him. <coughs> Let me back up just for a second. These Pharisees and Sadducees, John looked over at them and said, You generation of vipers, you bunch of snakes to grass. You bunch of people that are tearing this world apart. Who do you think you are? This little viper that he was, he was talking to was, they run about four to five inches long. They're about as skinny as a piece of wire. They hide in crevices in the rocks. And very aggressive as you walk by, they'll reach out and grab you. They're very poisonous. So the world is trying to keep you in bondage, is lurking around every corner, ready to strike when it sees a weak point, ready to bring a deadly poison into your body that God said, I want to set you free this morning. God's got a freedom this morning. I know we're low in number this morning, but that's all right. God had the message preached this morning to preach. And I want to tell you this morning, this morning, the bondage that is stopping you from believing what God said you can do can be broken. You said, I can't do it. And you're right, you can't. Only He can do it through you. This morning, if there is something binding you or holding you back, if, if you look in the mirror, all you see is the bad things. God said, I want to deliver you from that. I want you to see what I see. Anybody in this house want special prayer this morning? What going that route? Because maybe go that route because there's some need in the house this morning. Somebody is holding on and won't release God's blessing in your life because you say, I am not worthy. But He is. And His blood that was shed for you makes you worthy receive all the gifts that he has for you. Anybody this morning on special prayer for a change this one more time? If somebody do something else, I'm gonna gotta obey you. If I don't obey you, there's something wrong with me. Anybody have a special need this morning that they won't deliver from bondage for? If not, let me Strange it back around a little bit more. It's amazing how God turns things around it sometimes. Your this morning, if you want the baptism of the Holy Ghost to speak with other tongues, I want you to these offers right now. Your expectation is wanting God to work through you. The only way He can work through you is when He fills you with His Holy Spirit. If you want God to move in your life in ways you haven't seen before, He said, if you'll come, I'll fill you up and overflow it. If you haven't received the baptism of the Holy Ghost this morning, the Bible evidence is speaking in other tongues, I want you to come to this altar right now. And God said, I'm going to set you free from the things that sit around you and open you up to a whole new world. Anybody in this house this morning? escape the neglect so great of salvation, so great of anointing, so great of a power. In the last days I'm going to cry my spirit on all that will receive it. And all that will say yes. And all that will walk according to my pathways. Anybody this morning want to come or close this service out? Father, this morning we praise you for the grace and the enabling grace you're giving to this worldwide as these people stand and proudly proclaim I'm a Christian and I will not 
back up. My expectation is heaven is my home. My expectation is my sins have been forgiven. My expectation is that he's going to keep me on through this. To give me grace that I don't understand. So this morning, God, I pray as we leave this building this morning, that your hand will guide us and direct us and lead us in pathways we can minister to people that we couldn't only minister to. Make us, as we lay hands on that person, may we expect something to take place. Whether it happens that very second or the next day, may we expect something to take place. Father, we pray this morning, God, as we're in this place right now, that God, you would send in the hollow, the lame, the broken, the addicted, those that are in need, God, this morning. And God, I pray that you give us the ability to speak freedom unto them and help them through this time of freedom. Help them to understand there's a greater work in your life and your love than they ever understood. Use us, Father, here in this house to reach this dying world in these last days. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Anybody need anything more to close this service?